Colin, for joining us. And uh, let's hand it over to Alberto, who has some really cool stuff to share with us around the new services API. Um, take it away, Alberto. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Alberto Ricard. I am the NAT maintainer for the JavaScript uh, technologies here at, uh, at Synadia. And I'm here uh, today to actually show you the NAT services framework that we've been developing and we're putting in our clients. We believe that this will make it easier for you to write services and that's always a good thing. So with that said, um, obviously I have a very biased opinion and I think that NATS is the best technology uh, to implement services. And it all boils down to one feature in particular, which is we're location independent. We're not bound to an URL or DNS name. All you need is a connection to a NAT server and then all of a sudden you make a request, doesn't matter where in the cluster and some uh, service at the other end will actually answer and respond to your to, to your request. Um, because of that, we're able to actually scale up or down seamlessly and safely, right? Uh, the NAT server load, balance, load balances the request for us. And also it, it tries to actually uh, respond with a high degree of locality. That means that if the server knows of a service that is actually uh, more local to the request, it'll usually use that to, to fulfill the response. Uh, services in NAS have always been easy to write right but in order to do the management you have to actually do a lot of boilerplate and this is one of the areas that we're trying to actually uh, fit in and make it easier uh, for developers to 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 work out so the net services framework basically streamlines the development of these services and allows you to uh, implement them a lot easier so so yes it can be easier and the service obviously is simply just a subscription that handles uh, some requests but in addition to that, what we're doing is we're actually incorporating some metadata that describes uh, some uh, basic information about the service that then we can use to create a standard framework by which we can actually discover and monitor these services. So just by providing some very simple metadata, we're able to actually ask or discover all of the services that are actually available on the network. We're able to actually get info on a specific uh, type of service and find out, for example, what the schema is or maybe ask for the status of the service and provide how many requests it had a, it has actually handled and any kind of error that it might have run into and all of that kind of good stuff, right? That, that effectively moves away that sort of uh, common code away from your responsibility. You can focus only on the functional parts of your service, which is really in the end what you're trying to accomplish, right? So with that said, um, I actually wanna invite you to actually join with me and actually use a service that I've actually prepared for, for a demo. And this service is actually available on this uh, GitHub repo that I'm putting over here. It also has the instructions. So if you actually want to uh, be able to actually run this by yourself or, or, or take a look at how it's done, all of the code is here. And uh, since I'm actually the maintainer of the JavaScript technologies, obviously I'm gonna use JavaScript because that'll be uh, easier for me in some ways. And, uh, but in, for, for this demo, really all we need is actually to have Dino installed. And you can see a few ways that you can install Dino right here on, 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 the, um, on the screen. Um, and, you know, I'm gonna do that for you. I'm gonna install it. And uh, Dino is actually a, a very, uh, for, the, for the conference. And what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna run it right from, 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 from the, um, from the uh, from the command line. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do Dino run a and over here if you, if you actually follow the script, there's actually a shorter URL that you can actually type. So if you want to do something like this, right? Which I don't know why I'm not doing that. So I'm going to do it with you. Um, oops, I'm going to do a ping. I'm going to run one of those executables and actually uh, run that. What what I did here was I ran. Uh, a monitoring tool that I can actually use to ping all of the services that I have running on demo at NASIO, right? And so you can see that I have many, many uh, different badge generator services, and I have one that actually does uh, some frequency, right? And we'll get to those in a little bit. But the the one that is actually kind of fun is the one that we have here on 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 the on the screen. And on this one, all you got to do is basically specify your name and specify maybe a company, and if you hit it. It'll go away, it'll come back. And what you have at the end is actually a badge for the conference. So I can very quickly go over here and, and have my badge already prepared for me. That's actually pretty cool. So now going back to 
whatever the the slides are so that we're back in sync. Okay, where are we? Okay, so what just happened? Well, what just happened was we actually install, installed a, a JavaScript runtime. We downloaded the script from the GitHub repo. We executed the script, which connected to the demo network at Nats.io, and then it actually published a request using Nats to actually generate a badge for me, right? Uh, the Nats server basically selected one of the services to execute the request, and that service generated my PDF for my badge and then returned it to me. My the, the client script basically just saved it to disk, and then I, I was able to show you um, the badge itself, right? So that, that's actually pretty cool that very little did all of that. Uh, the way that it's done is actually fairly simple, and if you're familiar with Nats, it'll look very uh, similar to a Nats subscription with the addition of some metadata, right? So when you actually add a service, all you're really doing is you're specifying a name, a version, and a description. This is all metadata that we can use to then leverage for the monitoring aspect of it, right? And then you're also doing an endpoint. And the endpoint is the subject that the service is gonna be listening to, as well as the handler that is gonna use to process those requests. All those requests are actually run as a queue subscription. So the server is gonna be able to, um, to select a, a single server in, uh, service instance to execute your request. That, that makes it very easy to scale horizontally um, the deployment because all you gotta do is either start services to increase it or remove some of them to, to, to turn them down, right? The, the end result is some sort of server, server service struct or object that provides some methods or functionality so that you can observe it from within the process that you're running it, as well as gives you some functionality so that you can stop it and do all that kind of stuff. I, I can show you now, I have an example here, which is different from the one that, um, that we have on, 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 the, uh, on the repo, but since everybody likes a hello world, here's a hello world for, for the service framework. And what we do is we call our, our, our fun function to add the service, we provide an ads connection, and then we provide the metadata, which is the name of the service, which is reader. We provide some sort of version. We provide a description that is human readable type string. We also provide a schema, which is also a, a human readable type information about the inputs and the outputs that the service is going to produce, right? Then we go to the endpoint, which is the subscription type part. And we have the subject that the, that the service is gonna to subscribe to. And then we provide the handler, which is the function that will process the, the request. The handler will basically take a look at a message and there, there's also an argument for an error. If there's an error, the service can do something. Otherwise, it will actually try to get the data from the message, which is expecting some sort of string. It will manipulate the string in some form and then generate another result, which is a hello with the name that it found. If it found any, if it didn't find anything, it'll say stranger and return that response to your client, right? In a nutshell, that's, that's all you have to do. From there on, all the monitoring and everything else that, you, that we want to actually expose, we get for free. And the reason why we do that is because going back over here, we provided a name for the service and the name is actually shared by all instances of that service, right? The, the service is also gonna get an ID and the ID is automatically assigned whenever the service actually starts up, right? So based on that and using uh, our subject uh, uh, addressing, we can actually compose subjects that actually target all the services, uh, uh, some service types or a specific service in all of the services that are actually installed. So by, by default, right, or, or by, by design, we actually have a prefix of dollar sign serve for, the, for all the subjects that are uh, generated for the service monitoring, followed by a verb. The verb is ping, meaning everybody that's out there, show, uh, show me some info. We have a status, which reports usage information. We have an info that is actually the same data that the ping does. Right, and then we have the schema that reports the schema for the service. So, for example, if we want to query for all the services that are actually running on the cluster, all we have to do is say dollar serve ping, and we find out all the services that are out there. We can similarly gather their status, their info, or their schemas. Right? If we want to target a specific kind of service, we we do the same thing, put whatever verb we want, and then we also add the name of the of the service, and that will limit the results of the services that respond to that kind of service. If we have the ID of the service, we target the specific service that we're interested in. So I'm gonna show it again here, right? So over here, when I was doing the, uh, the, the ping, 
I could also have done name. And if I actually go and copy the, the frequency generator over here, you'll see that you only get one response. Of course, there's only one, so that is expected. Um, if we change that to the to the batch generator that we have, we will see that we will get all 16 instances of the server reporting in. Oh, actually, I see that other people are actually running services. That's awesome. <laughs> and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to pick one of these guys, and I'm going to pick their ID, and then I'm going to report on that. And then he's gonna he's gonna ping only that one. Of course, the ping is not very useful or very interesting here. Let's actually do a status. And if we do the status, he comes in and he says, "Oh, you know that that service has gotten no requests uh, since it started." So we can actually remove to see actually a little bit better uh, what's happening. And over here we can see the number of requests that these guys are getting, right? So again, if 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 I do some sort of watch. On, on the status, and I'm going to remove the uh, that, right? If as as services actually get kicked on and and folks start doing um, um, request badges, badges uh, I'm going to do uh, get badge. If I do that, right, I, I should see it actually increasing. So that's a uh, the monitoring. Um, That's awesome. So th this is kind moment. of setting up an API for services, if I'm understanding correctly, that is really setting up a bunch of really great conventions around here's some of the subjects that we want to be able to do for like managing and monitoring these services for being able to have uh, some lightweight service discovery, some lightweight metrics, some lightweight um, health check endpoints. And this is all happening kind of in the client and then you know there's no there's no changes to the server for this like this is all yes correct. Client. Uh, yeah. and it's all doing it for you by convention and because it's doing it by convention it's awesome because you don't have to worry about it you don't have to reinvent it you know we can develop and further that we can create tools around that and that makes it better and it makes it easier than for you to get your thing done which is all you're interested in i, I want to show awesome. one more thing and mm -hmm. and be, before we go really quickly and the thing that i want to show is there's a second service over here that you saw that is actually called a frequency service. And, and if I go and do Dino run and I go uh, get frequency, what that guy's gonna do is he's actually gonna see folks that actually requested badges. And he's operating on the same request subject that was actually being used to request the badges, but he's actually spying on the, re on the payloads of the request and then selecting the first name of those requests, right? So you can so use the frequency way, service to charge people. Yeah, you can charge people based on frequency. Very cool. I'm afraid it. we're out of time. We're going to move on to Caleb, who's going to show some really awesome stuff around uh, K3S and uh, its integration with um, with Nats. Thank you so much, Alberto. This was awesome. Can't wait to see more of this in the wild.